I'm telling you, I don't care. I don't care. Maybe, maybe Robert Morris was convinced, but I, just as a bystander, I, I didn't have encounters with Robert Morris. Like you have to understand, Gateway Church is so big. When I got there, that that I, I met with uh, Robert and a team of of leaders initially. But Robert isn't. He's not the pastor that has you know a reputation and a friendship with the worship team. He just doesn't. Like he wasn't coming back to the green room and challenging us and telling us you know to go after God. into communication between the attorneys for Gateway Church founder and their senior pastor, Robert Morris, and Cindy Clemeshire. Now, as we've reported for you before, Clemeshire claims that Morris sexually assaulted her as she was a child back in the 80s. Morris, as you know, resigned from the church. And our Aaron Jones uncovers what was inside new documents that we obtained tonight. Pretty devastating. Last month, Cindy Clemeshire publicly accused Gateway Church founder and senior pastor Robert Morris of sexually abusing her starting in 1982 when she was 12 years old. In 2007, Clemeshire hired an attorney and threatened to sue Morris. Now, newly obtained letters state the abuse continued until March of 1987 when Clemeshire was 17 years old. It says she is experiencing extreme emotional distress and ongoing mental anguish. In response, Morris Morris's attorney writes, it was your client who initiated inappropriate behavior by coming into my client's bedroom and getting in bed with him. Going on to say, your client acted inappropriately with two other men who stayed in her home between 1982 and 1987. According to your client, she had initiated the inappropriate conduct with these men as she did with my client. Last month, Morris admitted to inappropriate sexual behavior and resigned from the church. Four church elders have taken a voluntary temporary leave of absence while an internal review is done. All this comes as CBS News Texas has discovered new lawsuits against the church, one of which the mother of a minor claims her daughter was sexually assaulted by a member of the church and the church tried to cover it up, which the church denies. And tonight we reached out to Gateway Church to see if they want to comment on the letters that give more insight to the abuse that allegedly took place. We're still waiting for a response. Okay, so uh, that is a recap of things that have transpired as far as uh, Gateway is concerned, as far as Gateway is concerned with the situation there. So it looks like now uh, the uh, Gateway Church is done talking about this subject okay they want to, anything that has to do if people have questions about uh robert morris and cindy they should just reach out to robert morris and cindy okay so looks like there's a social distancing that's uh, taking place so now let's take a look at the article of uh some of the members what they are saying okay all right so here is, uh, uh, this is the article over here. It's not a long article, okay? But we're going to uh, take a look at this article together, okay? Let me just uh, set it up for you guys. All right, fine. Here we go. All right, Gateway Church congregants, former staff react to Robert Morris' sexual abuse allegations. Okay? I shouldn't be using that, you know, on this platform, so... One of Gateway Church's locations at 4209 Buzzwood Boulevard pictured on June 18, 2024. Okay, Jared King and his family have been going to Gateway Church for 11 years. He appreciated the Christian worship music and the community he built with other congregants. However, the day before the church's Father's Day morning service, King watched breaking news about the senior pastor being accused of S.A., a 12-year-old girl in the 1980s. We normally go to church at 11 a.m. on Sundays, and we already made a decision we weren't going to Gateway, King said. Robert Morris, founder and senior pastor of Gateway Church, resigned days after the allegations were publicized. Morris had confessed to and an inappropriate S behavior with a young lady, but didn't specify her age. And in uh, an internal June 14 statement sent by church elders at Gateway staff and later on X said Morris had been open and forthright about a moral failure he had over 35 years ago. On June 18, the board of elders of Gateway Church said they did not have all the facts, including the age of the victim 
and the length of, the ab of abuse and accepted Morris' resignation from Gateway Church that day. Gateway congregants, former staff, and government, and, and government officials shared how the events have left an impact on the community. Okay? King said he's frustrated with the lack of transparency. Church elders have had with congregants. He said he doesn't know yet if he will return to Gateway Church. And I quote, I'm all for redemption, but you can't have someone that's a child uh, be, be a leader in the church, period. That's just uncalled for, King said. It's a complete nightmare. King said he believes the board of elders who knew the details of Morris' history should resign. He also said he wouldn't be supportive of attending the church if Robert Morris' son and daughter, who are pastors at the church, were to lead the congregation. Morris had previously announced plans to step down from his role as senior pastor of the church. He nominated his son, James Morris, to the elders in February 2022 to be his successor. As of now, James Morris is set to begin his role as Gateway Church's senior pastor in spring 2025. Shannon Thomas remembers watching Morris' teachings on DVD before moving to South Lake with her husband in 2006. A big factor in relocating was to be a part of the Gateway community, she said. For six months, she worked as the administrative assistant in the family and marriage ministry for Gateway Church. When Thomas, a licensed critical social worker, found out that Morris was accused of SA, then 12-year-old Cindy Kremesha, she remembers feeling rather disgusted. The congregation was for so long to have been led to believe that yes, there was this moral failing, but we all thought it was with an adult, Thomas said. I think the shocking part is that all these years, that key factor was left out. Okay. Uh, third person over here, Bob Ham, a licensed marriage and family therapist served on staff at Gateway Church between 2005 and 2014. Ham said he was heartbroken when he found out about the news. If this were handled as a legal issue 35 years ago, none of this conversation would be happening, Ham said. Rather than have the church handle it and restore Robert Morris back to a platform, it would have been more like, let's get the police involved. Okay? All right. So, like, those are the, uh, the members who are speaking out uh, in regards to the situation. So, even right now, um, James Morris... He is a senior pastor. All of them, they have stepped down uh, pending this investigation. But when you go to the website, uh, Gateway website, Robert Morris is the senior pastor. Dr James Morris, the son of Robert Morris, is the one uh, who is taking over uh, this ministry, unless if something else changes. But for now, that's exactly what is uh, happening. Okay? So, now... Uh, Okay, there were these, uh, you know, some government officials also uh, chipped in. The Board of Elders Gateway Church, uh, they've hired Hands and Bone as a law firm, okay? So, there was um, a Twitter, okay, that took place when these things was happening, okay? Actually, a letter. Let's take a look at the letter first. From the Elders of Gateway Church. Pastor Robert, Mori Pastor Robert has been open and forthright about a moral failure he had over 35 years ago when he was in his 20s. And prior to him starting Gateway Church, he has shared publicly from the pulpit the proper biblical steps he took in his lengthy restoration process. The two-year restoration process was closely administered by the elders at Shady Grove Church and included him stepping out of the ministry during that period while receiving professional counseling and freedom ministry counseling. Since the resolution of this 35-year-old matter, there have been no other moral failures. Pastor Robert has walked in purity and he has placed accountability measures and people in his life. The matter has been properly disclosed to church leadership. Robert Morris stated, and I quote, when I was in my early 20s, I was involved in an appropriate S behavior with a young lady in a home where I was staying. It was uh, K and P and not I-N-T-E dash dash dash. But it was wrong. This behavior happened on several occasions over the next few years. In March of 1987, this situation was brought to light and it was confessed and repented of. I submitted myself to the elders of Shadow Grove Church and the young lady's father. 
they ask me to step out of ministry and receive counseling and freedom ministry, which I did. Since that time, I have walked in purity and accountability in this area. Two years later, in March of 1989, I stepped back into ministry with the full blessing of the elders and her father in October of 1989. Debbie and I met with her and her family and asked their forgiveness, and they graciously forgave me. This sin was dealt with correctly by confession and repentance, which I did in 1987 and in 1989. Guys, you know everything that has transpired? That was the letter, okay? I'll let you guys make your own conclusions as if, if, if Robert Morris uh, demonstrated that, right? With everything else that is happening right now. All right, guys. So now, while this thing uh, had, had taken place, okay? This was the tweet that was put out by uh, Thomas Miller, okay? All staff. Okay. Hi, Gateway staff. Some of you may be aware that a couple of blog posts and internet stories have popped up today about Pastor Robert and Gateway Church regarding something from over 35 years ago. I want to provide you with a statement from our elders and from Pastor Robert so that you would know the absolute thoroughness and transparency of this situation and so that you can provide the response and context. The statement is to empower you with the response if someone inquires, not as something to proactively send out to people. If a congregation member wants to talk further about anything, please direct them to your campus pastor. If a media outlet contacts you, please direct them to Lawrence Swissgood. Okay? So Lawrence Swissgood... Uh, this uh, guy who is, uh, I guess, in charge of, uh, you know, uh, the, the PR, okay? Hey, nothing wrong with having PR, okay? But now, this is what uh, Roland Swissgood is now telling people to do, okay? I guess at this point, they are, you know, they, they are done having this conversation, okay? So, this is what... Roran Swiss Good has put out. And I quote, okay, the inappropriate relationship Robert had with Cindy took place more than a decade before Gateway Church was started. Questions regarding Robert and Cindy should be addressed to them. Roran Swiss Good, Executive Director of Gateway Media. So now. <laughs> at this point, if people have questions, th this issue happened 10 years before uh, before of uh, Gateway, right? They don't want to talk about it. So my question is, why have they accepted uh, a law firm to do an investigation if their stance is whatever happened between Cindy and Robert was before Gateway started? So why are they allowing a law, uh, this company to come in to do this investigation starting from way back, starting from 1982 up to present? Because at that time, uh, Gateway did not exist. So why are they allowing the lawyers to do, quote unquote, their investigation so much so that four elders have stepped down? So they are not even consistent with the position that they are putting out over here. I, can, I get it. I understand they are tired. They don't want to be talking about this issue, right? I mean, hey, who wants to be talking about this issue? But I get it. But to me, I'm like, okay, if you guys want people to, to redirect what's happening to Cindy and Robert, then everything else, you know, you just have to shut down everything else over there. You know what I mean? Don't leave uh, anything open. So here is uh, this short clip, guys, okay? We'll get to the comments shortly. Here we go. Gateway Church representatives speaking out about the ongoing investigation into one of their pastors. Executive director of the church's media says, quote, the inappropriate relationships that Robert had with Cindy took place in the 1980s, more than a decade before Gateway Church began, and that questions about the relationship should be addressed to Robert and Cindy. This comes just a day after letters revealed that an attorney for that pastor blamed a child for initiating sexual contact between the two. 
That exchange from 2007 is between who says Pastor Morris assaulted Cindy from age 12 to 17 back in the 1980s. In response, his attorney blamed Clemishire, saying she initiated inappropriate behavior by going into his room and getting into bed with him. Morris resigned after Clemishire's allegations resurfaced last month. Okay, so there you have it, right? So to me, this is clear shows that get where uh, they are done to be uh to be having this discussion okay It'll be like you know if you have questions just go to cindy just go to uh robert morris <laughs> okay but you know all these things it's attached right it was a founder over there okay he was a pastor over there he said that everything was dealt with properly now uh the stuff has come out so this is uh what's happening i'm telling you i don't care i don't care maybe maybe robert morris was convinced but uh just as a bystander, I, I didn't have encounters with Robert Morris. Like you have to understand, Gateway Church is so big. When I got there, that that I, I met with uh, Robert and a team of of leaders initially. But Robert isn't. He's not the pastor that has you know a reputation and a friendship with the worship team. He just doesn't. Like he wasn't coming back to the green room and challenging us and telling us you know to go after God or like he had liaisons that did that because you know he ran from a different place. The church was too big. We all just understood that. Like I loved churches that had pastors that understood the creative and understood like how to really talk to your worship leaders. And you see certain churches that have that, that flourish um, more so in the creative in, in that. And Gateway just add, you know, Gateway's worship, we just always just backed up Robert. We backed up, you know, the vision for the church. And it was a great vision, you guys. It's not, there's, there, there, there's blessing. Okay. Uh, before we continue. Okay. Before we continue, right? Like uh, she just said something that uh, picked out to me. And to be fair, this is very prevalent in a lot of churches where the worship, right? Like, you know, the songs, the praise team is separate from the, the preaching, the teaching. So meaning that, you know, the choir director, the, the people who do music, they are just choosing the songs that they want to sing. And it's not in sync with whatever the pastor, right? When we go to church, whenever we sing, the singing as well is part of worship. So that is a responsibility of the pastor, the one who's bringing in word. So he needs to know what type of songs they're going to sing. Are those good songs? Are, they, are those theologically sound? And are they in line and sync with the message that he's trying to bring? So that's why whenever they're selecting songs, they always select songs that are matching what the, the preacher is going to preach. But if a preacher is absent from the singing, which means the message that he's bringing is like he's separating to him. It's just like, I just preach the word. That's all. That's all. That's just worship, right? The singing is just different. It shouldn't be so. So that's why even most places, even the person who is in charge of worship is also uh, like an elder, is also, like an, is also a pastor. Or if it's not, the pastor is the one who is making decisions when it comes to how worship is conducted in the church. In the church. That's why, you know, you, you can see like other churches, like, you know, the worship leader, they become like, quote unquote, like the in charges, you know. So I just picked that up. I'm like, oh, okay. That's how Robert Morris was rolling over there. So, but uh, let's continue. Okay. Millions of dollars were given away to the poor, really given away to the poor. Like, like people were ministered to, like, like every, everything that they've done, they can back. Like they're, they're, I mean, and, and unless there's just some weird, like thing that I just am like crazy, the workings and the going ons and the, and the blessed mentality of that church, that's genuine. Like what I saw kept me there. And, and I think that, that the Lord's compassion, um, stayed and allowance perhaps because of people that were giving their tithe and people that were sowing into these ministries and people that were, were, were meeting in the prayer groups and people that were in the Jewish ministries and people that were, you know, were, were the thousands of people that were volunteering and God looking down and being like, look at them volunteer and look at them serve. And then the way that, 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 that the leadership in those departments were like, we need to honor the volunteers. And then they would have these big bashes for volunteers to say, we love our volunteers. Like all these beautiful, beautiful things, like the single parents ministries, those were active things that are still happening in that church, like, like, like the salt of the earth stuff that the kingdom of heaven is all about. 
Do not be distracted by the lack of one man's confession that hid his iniquity, where he buried his iniquity perhaps under the authority and under the power and the prestige of what in mercy he was allowed and probably pressed down on. There is no way that I believe um, he could have carried even what he carried in, in speaking without constantly being reminded of that iniquity, that thing that he lied about. I, I, I honestly, you know, I, I was watching the man's body fail. And, and I'm just telling you, you know, for some people, you know, you may not see it in their teaching or their preaching, but, you know, it, it sin erodes the flesh, like it gets into us. And it's, it like, it has a field day on us. I, I just can't imagine that, that a man like Robert Morris wasn't in, in, in a daily, um, recognition of of what he had done, um, and and just didn't know how to uncover it after years of being professional at covering it up, and and so I I think that's a really valid question to ask ourselves: What is repentance? What is true confession? Like, like what we're seeing here is is something that was confessed and then made to look like it was this, and it was hidden because in order to build what <clears throat> what he felt like God had told him to build couldn't have been built if he had told the truth. Okay, so. Just Robert Morris did not confess. He made it appear, look like that he confessed, but he did not. Because the story that he told is not what happened. Because according to his own testimony, it was a young lady, right? Now we come to find out like, oh, no, it was a 12-year-old. That's not the same thing. You see what I'm saying? Like, if you'll be like, oh, I'm confessing what? I stole $10, right? Oh, fine. Oh, sorry. I forgave you, Violet, for stealing $10. And then you find out that, oh, no, it was $10,000. Honestly, are you going to see that I confessed? That now I'm telling you, oh, but I confessed. I told you that I stole money. But like, no, no, Violet, you said $10. You did not say $10,000. You see what I'm saying? So that is not a confession, guys. It's not a confession. So all these other things have, have come to light. Uh, Robert Morris has not issued any statement. Okay, I can understand, right? So whatever else he's doing between him and God, that's between him and God. But whatever is publicly available, he did not confess. He did not confess. That's not confession. That's not repentance. You cannot be confessing, uh, you know, you did this and then you did something else and you're calling that confession. Biblically speaking, that is not a confession. And anybody can see that. That's not uh, a confession at all. It is not a confession. Like Wow. Like the mercy of God. Like I'm telling you, I'm back. Like we should be back to the fear of the Lord. Like the fear of the Lord. That should shake us to the bones. Like the fear of the Lord. Like where is the fear of the Lord? Where are we shaking at the fear of the Lord when he allows us to build these things? And I think he, I think part of his mercy with Gateway was that he was, he turned and he looked at thousands and hundreds of thousands who were being fed who were being watered, who were being set free in freedom ministries, who were, you know, being, being, I mean, you guys, I was there. I was there. I, 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 I had in a massive God encounter in Kairos because it was a requirement on staff. And the first thing I did was enter into Kairos, had a massive God encounter. Like it was real. God was there. God was using the leadership of that. Did I have encounters with bad leadership? Yep. Did I have encounters with leadership that oppressed women and shut the voices of women? Yet, yeah. Do I think that part of that lie, part of that cover up, um, embedded in the very soil and the foundation of Gateway's DNA, um, uh, a, uh, an intolerance to the voices of women? Absolutely. I, absolutely, I do. And I think it's something that they are going to have to evaluate and they're going to have to actually, it's one of those things that God's going to have to, you know, um, and I think they will. I think um, they get somebody in who knows what they're doing. I am in full agreement with um, with the elders that they asked to step down. I, I think that was, that was an incredible move, an incredible act of God as well. Um, integrity. There's a couple of those leaders I think should have been removed a long time ago um, that have historical monumental things, but, but they're, that's like that in every church. Um, but I think it's also a season to, to be redirected and, and, and for churches that have, have felt a shaking in situations like this, because I do remember being on staff and hearing the story of the indiscretion and being like, Gosh, like, um, you know, is that why there is such a, there was such a, um, uh, 
You know, we just knew as women in on staff at Gateway, never to fraternize with guys in the hallways, don't be caught talking alone in an office with a male pastor, like things that I'm like, right, like that's genuinely like something that we should not do because you would never want to give an appearance like that's in scripture. But it was, it was very much kind of hounded to us. And I, I remember saying to somebody there, um, man, it almost feels like we're at fault here. Like, like don't fraternize with a woman because she might bring you down, you know, type of a thing. And I, I felt like that was coming from the story that, that Robert had told all these years about that. And, and so that's where, yeah, there was a part of my discernment that was like, why does that make me feel like I'm at fault here? And I just have an embedded kind of a, um, an understanding like, yeah, no, I never did that. Like I would never want anybody to see something. And, you know, I still like that to this day. And, and so, and those are just like, it's called a moral compass. Like, it's like, it's like an internal moral compass peeps. Like, it's like, that should be in all of us. And it should come like with the territory of being on staff. Like that shouldn't have to be like drilled into you. And, you know, and there were incidences in staff that were not talked about with indiscretions and certain things like that. And I often wondered, I'm like, I wonder if the biggest thing in this church will be that because that's the thing that, that he dealt with. And that's the thing that the enemy wants to come back and kind of whip into a frenzy here. And those are just things that I ended up going to prayer about because, because I do think that in churches like Gateway, there is the, uh, that there, there is the, the position um, in, uh, in, in dealing with uh, an instance like that, where there's the storyline of that happening, and that's like your, that's your history, that, um, that it could breed this mistrust toward women. And, and now as the story comes out, it's like, yikes. Like, and that's where, you know, um, that I would just encourage, like, Gateway houses like Gateway. It's like, you guys, there has to be a balance. I, I, I okay, let me just, I'm, I'm going to say things that I normally don't say, but I, I hope that, that you hear me. Like I am, again, I'm not a woman. I am, I, I am woman. Hear me roar. Like I'm a backseat Betty. Like I, I just am not, I don't need position. Like I'm strong and I have all my strengths and I come off really tough and I'm, and I'm strong. And I've had to be, you guys, I'm a single person. I'm a single mom. Like I have to be tough. If I'm, if I'm not tough, I'm going to get run over out there. And so there are godly strengths that I've had to maneuver because of where I've been and, and the, the, the road that God has me on. But, um, but there has been a, a, a marginalization of women's voices in the church that, that need to be heard. And it is not about, because here's the thing, when I did see, yes, in Gateway, you know, there, there were a couple people that, that were women that had, you know, authority and titles. And it was just like, yikes. Like sometimes you could just see this like air on them that would just kind of change them. It was like, oh my gosh. And, and that always bummed me out because I was like, oh man, come on, ladies, like don't get the title and then elbow somebody in the ribs. Like, just get the title and walk like Anna, like in the temple, like walk, walk like Hannah, like walk like Mary, like walk with authority, but walk with dignity, but don't be like, Dong! like, like trying to like elbow another woman out of the way or trying to elbow a guy out of the way. It's like, why? Like, why do we have to do that? And there, it's just the balance, right? It's bringing the balance back to some of these things where I'm like, I don't know why women have to do that, but I think it's like this, this this thing that sometimes as women were like, we're so oppressed. And then, then when we get, when we get anything at all, we're like, we're coming out like lions. And, and sometimes it's like, calm down. Like you don't have to be, you don't have to roar like a lion like that. Like, like just find the balance in it. Like find your strength because strength will own a room when it's real strength. Like a roar will own a room and quiet down everybody else. And, and I think as women, like there's the beauty of God redirecting the voices of women to stand up, even in worship. Like for those of you women worship leaders out there, like you've taken the helm and you know, it's, the, it's the male worship leaders that, that predominantly get all of the film, right? They get all the video content. And it's like, ladies, that's okay. Just take the back seat for a while because what we're actually, um, you know, being able to, to see as women is we, again, we, we take the, 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 the aerial view sometimes and God will give a woman the aerial view. A mother will know. A mother will know when her child is sick before her child is sick. A mother will know when they're sick. Okay. So anyway, she shared that. Okay. To me, one thing that I've seen you don't want to have women in leadership, certain leadership within the church. There's specific roles women can save within the church. But we know at Gateway, they have women pastors. According to the scriptures, women cannot be pastors. So when you put women in positions that the Bible doesn't want them to be, yes, you're going to reap what you're sowing. Simple and straightforward. Those are the things that are going to happen. Okay. So, yes, this is at Gateway. There's, a, there's people who have come out of Gateway 
ended up there's a pastor that uh, spoke with um, Justin Peters. He was there. Now he has his own church. Good, solid, sound man, right? So these things can happen. There's people who can be there and be deceived. And there's people who can be there and actually come to a true saving faith because God is going to save his people anyhow. But the things that are happening there, like you, you're looking for a good, faithful church. And what does a good, faithful church look like? A church that honors the word of God, right? All of the scriptures. You adhere to the scriptures. You have qualified elders, okay? So why do you have a woman as an elder? The scripture clearly states, I do not permit a woman to be an elder. So these are the, the things that you're looking for. So there's people who have left uh, Gateway. You know, like, you don't be discouraged. Find a church. There isn't a perfect church. Look for a good, faithful church, right? A church that preaches the word of God. A church that practices church discipline. A church that serves communion. A church that has qualified leaders, right? Elders who are qualified. So those are the things that you, uh, you're going to be looking at. A church that does not tolerate sin. A church that's all about the mission of God. Making disciples, right? Sharpening one another. It's all centered around the word of God. So on Sunday, your pastor is not telling you like, oh, I just want to share to you what's in my heart. Oh, this is what God told me. Oh, this is what I've seen. Like, no, he's opening up the scripture and he's telling you that says the Lord. And that's it. And that's what you want. So if, they, if people are going to come in, Christ is going to grow his church. It doesn't matter how many people are there, right? But this time around, the, the bigger the church is, it, quote unquote, that's a, a successful church, right? But if you have the Lisa Harpers, you, you are fine. Lisa Harper coming and preaching at your church. You are fine having Joyce Meyer coming and preaching your church. Uh, 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 uh. We have a problem. We have a problem. All lies will be exposed. That's all.